Hi, everybody, and welcome to Birth Talk. Today, I'm talking with Jody McLaughlin, and we are going to talk about the purpose of the Complete Mother magazine, of which she was publisher from 1989 to 2010. And we're also going to be talking about breastfeeding success. Hi, Jody. Hi, how are you today? I'm doing great. And I, I am too. I would love to first have like a, a two minute topic on something we that Susan and I forgot to talk about today, honoring new mothers and the importance of lullabies. If yes. you could address that. Uh, Michelle uh, Odant wrote a book about lullabies and he said all over the world, women are losing the skill to sing lullabies to their babies. And he saw this as a very bad omen because to sing a lullaby to a child is to impart with a sense of hearing to the child, a sense of voice to the mother and the inflections in the voice, a sense of security and love. And I don't know uh, what has replaced it, whether it's the uh, mechanical lullabies or the mechanical heartbeat devices or white noise, but none of them carry the chemical components of love and attachment. Wow. Very important. Do you think women just don't see it as important or it's just lost the fine art of translating from generation to generation maybe? Well, to, to sing a lullaby to your child, you would have had to hear the lullaby when you were little. And more importantly, you had to hear your mother singing those same lullabies to the younger siblings. Okay. And this, uh, this creates a memory like uh, Baba Black Sheep, Have You Any Wool. Okay. You know, it just, you know, it's, it's always there. And uh, you, you pull it out of your bag of tricks when a little person that you are holding needs soothing and um, uh, I am not the best singer, as reported by my lovely family members. That doesn't uh, matter though. A mother's voice is a mother's voice. You're not singing in a choir. You're not. What I, what I did was was the singing wasn't working, and so I went shh, 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 shh and that did work. He was very little. His mom was working on something. She asked me to come over. And after she had fed him, if I would just hold him while he was sleeping. And um, she was like that close to coming in and and uh, and uh, disrupting her online meeting because her baby was not happy. And, you know, I, I kept moving a little bit and shh, shh and he fell asleep. And I, I knew my daughter in the next room was saying, you know what, she still got it. Ah, <laughs> that's nice, that's nice. You also said that lullabies ha have to do with a chemical release that it's important for all mammals for bonding and that there's a release of milk that comes down for attachment does this happen while a mom is holding her baby, singing a lullaby, or is that in breast it, it can help, but usually the lullabies come after the nursing and um, we're ready to lay the baby down so we can you know, prepare a meal for the rest of the family, whatever. And um, she, she wants him to be in that level of sleep that being placed um, in um, in his crib or basin or whatever uh, won't jar him awake. And so this is the secondary, you know, patting, 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 sitting. And then when the baby starts weighing twice as much as he usually does, yeah. that's when you know he or she is asleep. Okay. And then gently, 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 
you know, uh, first warming it up with your hand because cool sheets or cool bedding, you know, can startle a baby awake. And I know that a lot of uh, people uh, have tried 100% body contact. And um, that's great for kangaroos and possums and, you know, some other animals. But uh, for humans um, with households and other responsibilities, it's just not very practical. And so I think uh, songs come from a need for the mother to not only take care of her baby, but to take care of herself and to take care of others. Nice. nice. Yeah, good. All right. Thank you. So let's talk about the complete mother. And first of all, why is it spelled, uh, misspelled? C-O-M-L-E-A-T. There was a magazine, Catherine told me, that was called The Complete Angler. And it was spelled C-O-M-P-L-E-A-T. And she thought that that was a great way to spell complete. And so uh, she decided that the name of the magazine was going to be Complete Mother. Um, I had one, one person ask me about the magazine and she said, tell me about the magazine, The Compliant Mother. Uh, she, I don't like that well, uh, I said, um, who are we complying with? If we're complying with the baby and the needs of the family, that's great. If we're complying with society as a whole, maybe not so good. But she was, she was trying to register in her mind um, what the word actually was because she knew it wasn't complete because it was spelled different. Um, the other message that Catherine wanted to convey, Catherine Young, is that this magazine is going to be different. It may not be what you expect. It could be a, a little edgy. We do take liberties, even with the spelling of the title. Okay. And so uh, be prepared for uh, some new information, new ideas, and raw stories. Very good. So the, the, the personality of the magazine complete that it was it was good for to spell it that way had to do with the personality so for the viewers who don't know Catherine Young was the publisher of the complete mother in Canada and you Jody handled the United States mm -hmm. okay did it go to any other countries did you have any oh, like yeah we were Australia, I, uh, Canada, Canada and I handled the United States and the rest of the world okay and we had subscribers from everywhere it was so phenomenal i i just i could not I, I i could not grasp that this magazine met so many needs in so many countries it was it was just it was remarkable and the best part of my day was going to the post office and picking up the mail and I never knew, I never knew what was coming. There was one um, one time I got a subscription from Minot, North Dakota. Oh, wow. Yeah. You probably this, wanted to go meet the person. This Well, um, you know, she wanted some back issues of the subscription. And I looked at the address and she was actually in my neighborhood. Oh, wow. Didn't even know you were? Probably. And so um, I bundled up some magazine, threw in some extra and some more stuff and and actually watch it over to her house. And wow. she said that she knew it was me when she heard the knock on the door, which you know, was kind of a sweet thing. Uh, it wasn't surprising to her that I would hand deliver yeah. um, her her material. And I was at that time introduced to her um twins yeah and um her name is alicia rosted and they moved away some time ago okay. and um i i hope to connect with alicia at some point because i left in her care uh, which she stored in a relative's barn loft um hundreds and hundreds of cop back issues of complete mother magazine yeah. And then when they left Minot to move to California, um, she left them in the care of uh, someone who with, was with La Leche League. Yeah. 
Okay. And so I'm hoping to contact Alicia at some point and see if we can track down those magazines and get the last of what's available out into circulation because unfortunately the the issues are we haven't fixed anything. Uh, the the problems that women were facing in um, uh, 2080, 90, you know, um, you know, they're still there. Good. Well, we, we can talk about that. Let me hold up what the complete mother look like. Okay. So this is kind of like a um, newspaper ish magazine. There are no glossy ads. There's a lot of content. Well, there are ads in here, but they're, they're different. They're not like, you know, tens of thousands of dollars, corporate sponsors and all, all that. All the ads were pre-screened by our baby board. And if our babies said, yeah, that's a good ad. That's something that we would like our, our moms and our dads to know about. Then the ad was placed in the magazine. If our baby board says, no, that's just going to distract our parents from what we need and what they need. And that's probably not something that we would want our family to have. And then of course that ad would be, um, well, we, we didn't do a rejection because, um, you know, this, this product is somebody's baby too. Right. And right. so we would, we would, I would say, um, uh, this, this um, does, well, first I would ask them if they were familiar with the magazine and almost always they would say no. By this time we were in all kinds of trade publications and everything and our ad rates were really low. And so they were probably going for the most reasonable ad rates. Mm -hmm. And um, they really didn't, didn't understand what the magazine was about. And um, I would um, ask them if they wanted me to send them some issues so they could get a better uh, idea of what we were doing. Yeah. And um, I was always, I was always conscious of not wanting to appear uh, unmoved by their efforts. Okay. I would just say, you know, that, that, um, well, I would tell them the story about the Stone Age babies. You know, if this yeah. is something Stone Age babies would like, then you know, the possibility of it being included is very high. If, if uh, it's not something, then um, it probably would not work to advertise in our publication because our readers probably would not be interested in that particular yeah. product at right. this particular time. Right. That makes total sense. So let me ask you, how did you get involved with The Complete Mother? Well, that is a great story. I was at a knapsack conference. And if anybody remembers David Stewart and knapsack national association of parents and professional professionals for safe alternatives in childbirth. Okay. Um, went to one of his conferences and there was a stack of magazines. And so I took a few, one for me and a few for my friends. And I went uh, back the next day and um, the the stack didn't seem to be any smaller. And I thought, well, either they've replenished it or nobody's picking these up. And so I picked up a few more. And then uh, the last day I took everything that was left okay. and brought back a stack of, of uh, magazines to share with my friends. And a number of my friends subscribed and then they talked about it. And so I thought, and I had not, I just hadn't gotten around to subscribing yet for myself. Now wait, um, was, this the, was this already the Complete Mother Magazine in print from Canada? Catherine Young had started it in 1985. Yes, and she knew about David Stewart's, Stewart, uh, David Stewart's work. And she thought that this conference, this Knapsack conference would be fertile ground for new subscribers. Okay. So uh, eventually I did subscribe and I sent her some articles that um, I thought would be important. And uh, one day she called me and she said, um, would you like to be the publisher of Complete Mother Magazine? 
or no, no, she didn't say that. She said, do you want to distribute the magazines in the United States? Okay. And I said, what would that involve? She said, I'll ship them to you and uh, you'll have all the addresses and then you just put the addresses on and, and mail them off. And that's okay. every three months. And oh, I could do that. And then I, w I was okay with that. And she said, well, now that the subscription base is increasing in the United States, I think it would be a good idea for you to print the magazines in the United States instead of me shipping them down. And I said, but I don't, I don't, I don't have enough money to pay for the printing. And she said, well, s sell more ads. Yeah. Get more yeah. subscribers, sell more ads. Right. And I said, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so I did that and that went well. And she said, now I want you to handle the international subscribers. Wow. And I said, I can do that. Yeah. And uh, it just, it just, you know, slowly as she saw, she treated me like you treated me. As she saw that I had a grasp of things and I was improving and I could um, accommodate new responsibilities, then she dished them out. And if I had an objection, she told me how to fix it in like a 30 second wow. response. Yeah, smart woman. And, um, she liked how I used words. She liked my skills as a, a proofreader. Yeah. Um, later that kind of became uh, the editor. And I, I knew the subject matter because I had been a childbirth reform activist for a number of years. So I knew the territory, you know, backwards and forwards. And um, that went on for a long time. And there was, there was one time I remember where um, the cover wasn't the best cover. Uh, I think it was a cartoon. And I said, oh, I'd like to put a different cover on. She said, sure. Okay. Don't and I said, oh, okay. And then I put the um, the uh, the cartoon into the body of the magazine so nobody missed anything. Okay. Uh, but um, if I had a better idea, go for it. Great. And, you know, she was just so, uh, she persuaded me that I had a good eye and a good mind and a good will and that uh, this was changing the world. And of course it was. Um, it was changing one family at a time in, in communities and which it still does. Now it's changing hopefully the next generations, those moms who read it and practiced attachment parenting. Hopefully the children who grew up in those families see the high value and preference in raising a family that way. And hopefully they, they will. Mm -hmm. And um, so well, it, changes, it changes one life that changes the whole world. It does. However, you did say, we'll have to talk about this, whether you want to talk about it now or a little bit later. You did say that the 1980s, 1990s, 2000s, things haven't changed, that there is still a need for this magazine. Mm -hmm. So in the big scheme of things, when you talk about percentage of our culture, who raises a family according to these principles, it's small. Is that kind of what you mean? That we really, we haven't stopped circumcising. We haven't increased um, breastfeeding uh, success rate. The mm -hmm. breastfeeding level is still very low in this country. Mm -hmm. Do you know what the current breastfeeding level percentage is in this country? I don't know. Well, um, I know that the records are kept and maintained by one of the formula companies. Wow. Because it's very important for them to know whether their product use is going up or down. Okay. Um, um, I don't see a lot of it. I don't see a lot of it either. And I don't see any, I don't see much in public. Um, I haven't ever really seen much in public. I did see it when I was a young mom amidst other women, you know, they, those are the people I sort of, you know, maybe hung out with a little bit, but there still seems to be 
a shame or a burden or it's not preferable? My experience is that they tried and it didn't work. Okay. And the last thing someone who has tried and it didn't work once is someone to be um, disparaging even with a look that, oh, I see you're not breastfeeding. Um, so I usually go straight for, mm, I think your baby is about six months old. Yeah. And she'll go, oh, yeah, he's five and a half. And um, I use that as a uh, as, as, as an engagement. Yeah. When I used to work at a men's clothing store, a guy would walk in and I would say, um, 34, 32. <gasps> How did you know? <laughs> and, you know, after a while, you just know. And so I, I use that knowledge to engage in a, a very neutral but personal way. And um, what I have found is the only answer to any kind of breastfeeding difficulty is the bottle. And if that's the only trick they have in their bag then that's the one that they're going to pull out every time. Oh, you try. That's so nice. But, you know, sore nipples, you know, are, are um, um, really painful. And But you tried, you know, and your baby got, you know, two days of good milk. So, you know, you're, you, you did your best. And I, I certainly am not interested in taking that away from them. But what hospital-based lactation consultant is going to tell a woman that um, uh, a, a way to deal with sore breasts, including the nipple, is to stop washing the nipple, number one. The best emollient for a nipple is the breast milk itself. And if, if uh, she has just a generalized feeling of soreness, um, she can stick a torn to size cabbage leaf inside of her bra. Oh, okay. <laughs> and um, I don't know if that story is still circulating, but for crying out loud, it works. And, you know, I don't know why, but it does. Okay. I and, never knew that. So I'm glad you're sharing that. Yeah. 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 Um, people have to have tricks but they have to know that they're tricks. And a professional like a certified lactation consultant can't afford to use tricks. She can only use things that have science behind them. Okay. Something that's readily acceptable by the, the larger medical community in which she thrives in. I see. And um, I, uh, I have visited uh, a number of personnel and WIC programs, mm -hmm. and uh, there's two kinds of WIC offices. One where the majority of the women who work there have breastfed their children, uh, some of them for a considerable length of time, yeah. and they are marvelous, and their breastfeeding rates are very high in that, um, in that yeah. office. The, the people that they serve. Yeah. And the other WIC office is women who tried but couldn't, right. or women who didn't because there was something about it that um, made them uncomfortable. Okay. And uh, so they don't have the hormonal experience that make you and I and hundreds and thousands of other activists mm -hmm. so intent on giving women a chance to feel what they have felt, which was the all is right with the world feeling. I am here, my baby's here, my children are here, you know, we're, we're doing really well and isn't this great? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's that feeling. Let's see, what can I compare it to? Um, I used to have a comparison that was great, but I can't think of it right now. Um, I'm doing a lot better than I did, but you know, the, yeah, after the chemotherapy and everything, it, it does take a while for me to, right. I get my confidence back, but okay. sometimes the words, words um, don't come to me right away. 
All right. But, I don't uh, want to change your line of thought, but what would you say to women who say, oh, my baby wouldn't latch on correctly, or it, it had a problem with it sucking the rooftop of its mouth, couldn't latch on right. That's a common thing that I hear. Therefore, the baby failed in the process and I couldn't breastfeed because the baby mm -hmm. has something biologically wrong. Mm -hmm. what, what kind of, I'm sure you've heard those stories. What do, yeah. you, do you have to say about that? Um, get another opinion. Okay. Talk to someone who has successfully overcome that particular difficulty. Mm -hmm. um, you cannot get the information you need from someone who doesn't have it. Good point. And um, one thing that I told a woman who um, had XYZ ABC problems with nursing um, or with breastfeeding and um, she was also working and breastfeeding and you know the combination wasn't it was difficult and i know many women do it and are successful at it but you know some of us can't quite swing it anyway she was so sad that she had to give up breastfeeding and i said can i offer you a suggestion um i've learned to do that because some people don't want suggestions right. um uh, that's one of my maturity things that I've started doing. Uh, I said, even if you can't breastfeed your child, you can still nurse her. Oh, and she funny. said, she said, what do you mean? And I said, well, after you fed her, do you sit in a rocking chair and give her a pacifier and just rock and, you know, sing to her, talk to her until she falls asleep? Do you ever do that? Oh, yeah, all the time. And I said, well, instead of giving her a pacifier, give her yourself. Mm -hmm. So then you can have the satisfaction of her nursing. Yeah. And she can have the satisfaction of nursing. And at this point, whether or not there's an abundant milk supply is irrelevant. You're nursing. You are nursing your child. That's fantastic, Jody. because a lot of people think in black and white terms. If they biologically fail at breastfeeding, they're totally and completely done. I never would have thought to do that. That's great. That's a great tip for people. So let's get back to the magazine. So you I sort of... Read, I want to read the, the reason for the magazine's existence. Okay, great. For the purpose of promoting natural, enjoyable birth and full-term breastfeeding, we welcome wise women and men to reproduce our stories, artwork, and news without obtaining permission. Without obtaining permission. That is so good. You know. Yeah. 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 If something looks good and you want to use it, use it. Yeah. And uh, then we go on to say, please don't send any one of a kind articles or artwork. We prefer copies that won't cause the world to end if they get lost. We aren't careless, just overwhelmed four times a year. Very good. And I know you you told me recently you don't remember how many subscribers, but in the tens of thousands, would you say? Yes. Okay. That's great. That's a lot of work. You were busy. You were busy. Oh, I was shipping out magazines, and I spent a lot of time at the post office. And one of my more um, interesting moments was – when you see someone at the post office often, you, you develop a high, high relationship. Yeah. And this guy didn't know who I was, but I knew who he was. He was a detail man for Ross Laboratories. Okay. Which, uh, which, which is like the enemy. Formula. <laughs> yeah. And um, they would get, his company would get the information from the clinic who had a baby and when it was born. And then at that six week, oh, this is so hard. I don't know if I can do this. And he wants to nurse all the time. And of course there's a six week growth spurt that we have to accommodate. Mm -hmm. And it can it can uh, undermine a woman's confidence if she feels like she's nursing all the time and the baby's never satisfied. Well, that's because the baby is busy increasing her milk supply. 
Yeah. And it takes a lot of nursing to, you know, get her to produce more milk on a consistent. So um, uh, Ross Laboratories in the whole formula industry know about this six week window of opportunity. Mm -hmm. So he would go to the post office the same time that I was mailing out boxes of magazine and mail out boxes of free artificial baby milk. Uh, wow. You know, at the same time that she was feeling overwhelmed and maybe this isn't working. Wow. Would, come in the mail. Yeah. Like manna from heaven, you know, wow. here, here I was, you know, not sure. And then this must be Providence. This must be a good omen. You know, I'm supposed to, I mean, their timing was, was impeccable. Mm -hmm. um, however, I didn't have access to those lists. So uh, I wasn't able to send out, uh, the magazines or, you know, yeah. anything in support of breastfeeding, but they have, they have, uh, they, they, the system supports each other. There was another thing about the formula industry that um, if I've already told this, let me know when, you know, people can watch our previous podcast, mm -hmm. but um, there came a time where, the formula companies were being ragged on because they were undermining breastfeeding. And, you know, the story that I just told you is a case in point. Right. And they said, oh, no, oh, no, we we are in favor of breastfeeding. This is just for women who can't. Yeah. And um, to prove that we are supportive of breastfeeding, we spent – one million four hundred sixty thousand dollars and eighty two cents last year on promoting breastfeeding oh well you know how did that come about well uh we donated ten thousand dollars to this conference that had a session on breastfeeding yeah one little session token and and we we donated x number of dollars or you know free breastfeeding brochures from the formula company, how to breastfeed, uh, to you know this program or that program, and um, what happened is every time the Leche League was asked to speak at a conference, mm -hmm. they were there with their checkbook in hand, so that they could say, "We do support breastfeeding because we we gave this particular uh, conference X number of dollars." Okay, so then. Uh, when the Leche League found out that they were claiming to support breastfeeding because they were giving all this money for breastfeeding education, um, the Leche League said, we will not appear at any conference where formula company money has been donated. Very good. So that they could... Yeah. Not use that as a sure we support breastfeeding. Yeah, conflict but of that, interest. But but La Leche League actually shot themselves in the foot because then the formula companies could donate a hundred dollars, fifty dollars, twenty-five dollars to every conference in the world. Okay. So that La Leche League could not be present. Oh, oh, that's terrible. Those snakes. Oh, that's horrible. I, I want to uh, send, share with you a very nice comment that comes from uh, Nicole. She says, you, Jody, you and Catherine Young were my lifelines as a new mom out in the middle of nowhere with no breastfeeding support. And she's gone on to become a midwife. And I think she introduced me to your magazine. 1996 or somewhere around there. So Sweet. yes, yes, Sweet. I'm sure that's wonderful. So thank it, you. Nicole. The magazine does change the world. It does. But uh, let's see. So, oh, you said oh, I wanted to say one more thing about Catherine. Okay. Nobody can forget the day that she died. I know. And at 9 a.m. She died at the same time the twin towers came down. I remember September 9, 2001. Yep, September September 11th at like 9 a.m. Mm -hmm. Cancer related? Was she about 53? Uh she she had breast cancer. Yeah. Which is kind of strange, you know. Here well, she 
she she claims it was because um she was fed carnation milk with carol syrup that was that was the formula at the time and um her her mom was like most moms oh this really is better okay mm -hmm. I certainly want what's best for my child and uh, undermining the quality of breast milk is so pervasive. Mm -hmm. Those who truly understand not only the mechanics of breastfeeding, but also the content of the milk changes over a period of time and it contains the antibodies specific for whatever that child has been exposed to. I mean, it is absolutely phenomenal what breast milk can do. Mm -hmm. If it was, if, I mean, it's almost magic what it can do. It's, yeah. um, but the, the one problem with breastfeeding is that there's no financial exchange. Mm -hmm. right. There is the only benefit that breastfeeding provides is to the baby, to the mother, to the family, and to the community as a whole. Mm -hmm. But it is not an income generator. Um, if the breastfeeding doesn't succeed, it's like a natural disaster where when a community floods, the carpet stores do great business. True. Um, you know, um, kind of like support somebody, somebody takes up the slack from what wasn't working correctly. So yeah. when you read the description of the complete mother magazine, you said full term breastfeeding. What does that mean? We don't know. Okay. Um, we, we suspect that the, I read this someplace years ago that the average length of breastfeeding around the world is 4.2 years. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the average time for weaning It's 2.4 years. 4.2. Uh, 4.2 years, 4.2 years. And then I, I look at that through a different lens. And uh, one is that um, the, the standard at the time that Jesus was born, that um, children would be nursed until they're five or six. Okay. And when Sakakawea, who was um, on the Lewis and Clark expedition, mm -hmm. returned from the expedition uh, four years later, mm -hmm. um, one of the captains wanted to take, I think it was Lewis, wanted to take Pomp to uh, um, wherever he was going so that he could be properly educated. Okay. And uh, Sakakawea told him, oh no, you know, I can't let him go. He's still nursing. Mm -hmm. So he came back uh, a couple years later when he was weaned, he was no longer nursing. And then he took him to educate him properly. Okay. Um, so now, um, we have children that, so when, when um, we, we played with the word extended breastfeeding, but that sounded like a competition, you know, like extended past what's normal. Right, what's past normal. one, yeah. Um, and so the, uh, the term, uh, full term, we know that a full term baby is around nine, nine and a half months. Mm -hmm. And full term breastfeeding uh, has not been established. Right. Because we have not allowed it to. Yeah. At least in, in our point in time. Yeah. So uh, we Nicole can look at animals. Yeah. and see when they are weaned. And um, I have a little visual here. Mm -hmm. I love these 
these little books that are. Okay, it says. Uh, it's a uh, mare and foal. Okay, mare and foal. So about mom and baby. Yeah, and. Yeah, we're not going to really be able to read it. There we go. I just want you to see the picture, the picture. of the yeah. foal. Yeah. If we looked at it from an um, age uh, appropriate maturity level, um, most animals wean their offspring sometime before puberty. Okay. So, is, yeah, a long time. Yeah, I know a couple of people who breastfed till eight, eight years. Um, anyways, Nicole writes and said, I breastfed my, bio, my biological children for six. She has three biological children, six, six, and five and three quarter years. She says, I tell people that often because cultural extremes can help push the envelope of what is possible, acceptable. And I, I definitely know that. My youngest two were breastfed till I think five and a half years old. Mm -hmm. And what I love about that is they remember those two know what it's like to breastfeed. So if they, if they go on to one is a girl, one's a boy, if they go on to have families, they, they sure as heck will know the benefits beyond anything. And there was a time where I'm not going to say they were, they were embarrassed. So, you know, it, it's kind of funny. Like I would say, Oh, I, can I tell your friends you were breastfed until five and a half? No, no mom, don't do that. You know, just because the world doesn't see it. Mm -hmm. There was a time where when I was out in public, my son was about 10 pounds when he was born. And until the age of two and four months, I would breastfeed him in public. Now that's a big, he was a big, a big toddler walking around. And then there was a time where I just felt the looks and I said, Mikey, uh, we're just going to breastfeed at home, you know, close to home from now on, just because I told him because the public doesn't understand or accept it. And so not that I was completely embarrassed, but others might have been uncomfortable. It, it, it's kind of strange. And so that reflects on the whole breastfeeding community. If, if someone sees uh, a mother nursing an older child mm -hmm. and uh, feels uncomfortable about it, that feeling washes over all breastfeeding, even of the newborn. Mm. Because it's, well, she'll probably nurse him until he's, you know, in high school. Yeah. or whatever yeah um so that was altering your sensibilities to meet the needs of the larger whole is a very mature thing to do and i just remember being in church of all places picking up my my toddler he wanted to nurse and i did never wanted to swat him away no 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 so i tried to indiscreetly you know mm -hmm. pick him up and he was heavy and big and I just did my thing and minded my own business. But there came a time where I just thought, okay, we will, we will do this. You know, mm -hmm. mainly when you're around non breastfeeding, you know, you'd see bottles mm -hmm. and never mind mm -hmm. even breastfeeding a one or a two month old. Unless it's a sermon about how long Jesus was breastfed. Uh, I don't know if you'll ever hear that sermon ever. I don't even, I don't even know if they know or think about it. There's very few priests and, and, pastors. I was, I, was, I was at church uh, one Christmas Eve where the priest did talk about Mary nursing Jesus. And when the collection plate rolled around, I pulled out one of my Complete Mother magazine business cards and wrote on the back of it, thank you for your endorsement of breastfeeding. Good. And uh, he called me. Oh, wow. Yeah, and we had a nice conversation, and um, I told him what I knew about the role of the Catholic Church in in the um, denigration of uh, women breastfeeding their children, um, and I specifically spoke of the changes in the artwork. Yeah, and how the baby was close, and then over years and years and years, the baby was farther and farther away. Yeah, and. Um, he, he was aware, you know, of this thing, just like, like, uh, some priests are aware that at one time priests could marry. Yeah. And then, um, uh, uh, a decision was made that they 
could not be married, that they must be celibate. Yeah. And so um, it's always interesting to see how men, and I'm using that word not to denigrate all men, but it's usually the patriarchal structure, not the matriarchal structure, that keeps uh, changing the rules. Okay. And um, it's it's important for us to think about the the rules and who made the change, why the change was made, who does the change serve. Um, is this a change I'm comfortable with? Am I obligated to follow it? Um, can I protest? Can I write a letter to the editor? But it's important to think about what is being imposed on you and asking yourself, does this work for me? Good. Does it work for our society as a whole? No. That's why I'm so chagrined that the, um, the, WIC program is under the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Yeah, really. And it was lobbied through Congress by guess who? Uh, Nestle or a formula company? I don't know. Yeah. The formula company lobbied the WIC program through Congress. Uh, I don't know what Health and Human the Services WIC, does. The, but. WIC, the WIC program is the largest promoter of artificial baby milk in the world. Wow, that's horrible for the, the people who need it and most. Here we have, here we have all these um, uh, tax, tax, um, tax so money is paying their employment. Yeah. And they're promoting a substandard product consistently. I mean, yeah, except, for those few offices, except for those few offices where, you know, the women really are dedicated to breastfeeding and do whatever they can to, to help women be successful. There was one woman that um, uh, was uh, working at the WIC office on one of the reservations in North Dakota. Uh -huh. And um, every month that the woman was still breastfeeding her child, she got another package of disposable diapers. Okay. And there was, there was great breastfeeding success because it came with perks. Okay. And uh, although, you know, uh, I, I, I'm not real fond of the idea of disposable diapers, I thought she was incredibly creative and very resourceful, and it worked. Okay. And when it comes to what's better or worse, disposable diapers or artificial baby milk, well, you know, right. yeah. figure that one out. Um, I also remember talking to a woman about how long Native women breastfed before the uh, before the change, the big change. Uh -huh. And she said, well, um, when I was in boarding school, where they, they would t take the babies or take the children and put them in boarding school for a proper education, Right. Um, my mother would hide behind a rock and at recess time, I would go to her and I would nurse. Oh, wow. And I said, well, that's what recess is for. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you know, uh, she, she wanted to maintain a contact with her child, even though the child was in boarding school. Yeah. And, um, so that means she was a uh, being nursed, you know, while she was six or, or older. Yeah. So why don't you share the story of a cultural breastfeeding success? Aborigines, like community. Remember the story you shared with me recently? Um, if a baby needed soothing and in some cultures, a, another mom? Yes, yes. Uh, it depends on how much... Um, again, I, I think it comes to ownership and responsibility. And we talked about women being owned and children being owned. And uh, men are owned too by those at the top own the men as well. So men have also been victimized by this. Remember my cup? Save the males. Save the males. Yeah, because whatever hurts... Um, 
women and and their children also hurts the fathers and the men. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I'm sorry. What was your question? I the question was. Uh, like in our culture, we have a uh, monogamous family, a nuclear family. The mother nurses her own baby. Oh, what yeah, about other cultures of success where the, they're the tribe or the community sure. will talk for each other? And in those mm -hmm. communities, is there longer breastfeeding? Is there less stress? Is there less crime? I think, um, I think the more primitive a culture is, the less crime. Okay. Uh, the more advanced a culture is, the higher the crime rate. Because if all you have to do is cooperate with your environment to have all your needs met, what's the point in stealing? You know, if you need something, you can simply ask for it. And or if, if, they're, if they're not around to ask, you just take the spear and go hunting and bring it back. If you break it, you know, you make them a new one. Um, there, there are some cultures where there is no such word as theft mm -hmm. because it simply isn't done. If somebody comes and takes your spear, it's probably because they needed it. Yeah. And I remember um, after I went to college coming home and, and inquiring of my dad, why don't you ever lock the doors? And he said, well, what if somebody needs to use a phone? <laughs> wow. Um, well, yeah, that's, that's true. And I said, well, what if somebody steals your TV? He said, well, they probably need it more than we do. Wow. And um, and I, I I said, you know, because I was, I was uh, trying to match my new environment that I was in with the old environment that I grew up in. I was trying to justify some of the uh, conflicting messages I was getting. And I said, you always leave uh, your keys in the car. And he said, well, what if somebody needs to borrow it? Wow. <laughs> and, um, you know, it was like, that makes sense. Yeah. You know, we live in a community. We don't have to lock everything down. We don't have to, to um, hover over our stuff to make sure nobody else gets it. If somebody else needs it, they're welcome to it. And if they can bring it back, they will, and if they can't, maybe they'll replace it. But I wanna ask a quick question um, right now, um, because I have my little prompter here. Who was the first federal employee to take her breastfed baby to work with her? Now, I don't want you to answer it. I'm not, because I might know it. And so yes. we don't want have too many help. listeners right now. We don't have too many okay. listeners right now, but you'll have to answer it in a few minutes. Okay. Um, um, I want to tell you something that happened to me when I was 17. Okay. I, or no, I was, I was, I was 18. I went to Washington DC yeah. with a 4-H program. And one of the things that we did one evening is we played this game and I'd like to look it up, see if it's still out there. It was called the game of democracy. Okay. We were broken up into the groups. It was a board game. And, um, you know, there'd be bills and, you know, House and Senate and all this stuff. And mm -hmm. I, I uh, raised my hand for one of the, the moderators. I said, we're not playing this game right. And she said, what do you mean? And I said, well, he told me that if I vote for this for his community, that he'd vote for that for my community. We're not even talking about the merits of this project or this program. Okay. We're just trading votes for, for you know, that will enhance our little, our little pocket of influence and our voters, you know, the ones that we want to vote us in next time. And I said, we're not even talking about the merits of this bill that's being um, considered. Okay. And she said, yeah. And I said, well, that's wrong. She said, well, that's the way it is. Oh, wow. And I went, I was, I was, I was 18. I went, you're kidding. Yeah. You're kidding. And um, I was sent to this program in Washington, D.C., because I was supposed to go back to my community, uh, which was uh, Morton County in North Dakota, and go around 
and do talks on citizenship. Mm -hmm. And I was so embarrassed by what I had learned. I couldn't yeah. do it. Yeah. Um, if, if I knew then what I know now, I would have said, there's something really, really wrong in our democracy. Yeah. And that is that it is not democratic. That it is influenced way more by money than it is by, uh, is this the right reason for us to make s seven generations hence? Right. And um, I was ashamed. Yeah. I was embarrassed yeah. for for what I had learned. And I didn't know if everybody else knew it, and I was the only one who didn't. Um, I didn't know if uh, if this was obvious to everyone except for me. But I have a feeling they maybe weren't paying attention and weren't thinking as deeply as you. That's that would be my guess. That well, you had a, a very probing oh, question that they had not considered. That because well, the rest of my board mates, when we were playing this game, the rest of the table, nobody had any problem with it. Yeah, see, I don't think they thought of it as an issue. Yeah, so, it was, well, this is the way it's done. So that's how we're playing the game, because it was a game. So do you link that to breastfeeding? And we, our time is running out. So, so try to wrap up with some kind of concluding statements or suggestions. If it doesn't make sense to you, either don't do it or ask clarifying questions. And uh, very, very quickly, I want to, uh, this is the CIA fact book that I mentioned a couple of, of oh, yeah, uh, okay. and um, of course this one is outdated, but you can look up the infant mortality rates of all the countries in the world and, um, uh, the last I checked, there are there are more than 50 countries that have lower infant mortality rates than the United States. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, I also mentioned the importance of knowing fertility, honoring our cycles. Catherine yeah. Singer, uh, Katie Singer, Katie Singer. Yeah. That's good and fertility, natural family planning, understanding the woman's body. I, yeah. I don't care what you're doing in regard to, I don't, I don't care if you're celibate. You still need to know when you're ovulating. Mm -hmm. And if you are a man who can process new information, you need to be aware of these cycles as well. Because um, you want... Uh, if it's your choice to to uh, be with a woman, marry, have children, then you need to know that someone who is on artificial hormone-based contraceptive may not be herself, may not be her true self. Mm -hmm. This is also uh, a book written by the same author, Katie Singer. Yeah. And um, it's it's important. Um, I I do. I do Please realize a lot of people. See it. Please say the title of that book. Yes, it's called An Electronic Silent Spring. Okay. And the author is Katie Singer. Okay. And um, she, she quotes me in here. She said, Jody McLaughlin, Washington. And what I said was, I find it ironic that in my search for a place with minimal um, radiation uh, frequency exposure, I tell people that I'm looking for a house in a dead zone. Oh, wow. And um, this is also by Katie Singer. Okay. If you want to read- Of a broken heart. Yeah, when, when I, um, I read the book, she sent it to me for a review, I read the book, I called her, I started talking to her, and I started weeping. Wow. And she said, what's wrong? And I said, your book was so good, I don't know what to say. Um, so I'll tell you right off the bat, I didn't like the cover. Okay. <laughs> and I said, it, it looks like a bodice-ripping romance novel. And she said, thank you for that. I didn't like the cover either. But 
<coughs> the publisher gets to make that choice. They do, yeah. And the first line of this book uh, was stunning, you know, and she had me at, you know, yeah. and she also, you know, signed it, uh, signed it and everything. Um, and we've been friends. I haven't met her yet, but we've been friends for, geez, maybe, maybe 30 years. Wow, nice. And I also talked about the Pope being nursed, breastfed back to health. Oh, yeah, that's a fictional novel. Yeah. The Anatomist. Uh, the Anatomist. And Federico Andahazi okay. is the author. All right. And so if anybody is looking for something very thought provoking, yeah. you know, you, you need to look at that. Great. And um, next time I would like to talk about implements which are not benign okay. in, in the birth environment. And I also want to talk about the phenomenon of making birth easier and safer. And this is this is a horizontal whoa, this is a horizontal birth. You know, it just, you know, gravity isn't working with you. And this is a vertical birth where things just open up. Oh nice. The baby. Look at that. That's good. Yeah. So we'll we'll talk about that. Okay. And the reason um, Complete Mother Magazine and me and you and lots of other people are interested in birth is because it can have a tremendous impact on breastfeeding success. Mm -hmm. Therefore, a better birth, a better experience overall makes nursing your baby easier, more comfortable. And um, thank you. All right. Thank you, Jody. We'll see you next and time. The first woman, uh, the first federal employee who yeah. took her breastfed baby to work with her was Sakakawea. Okay. Uh, she was uh, 16. Yeah. And um, her baby was three months old when the expedition started. Yeah. And he was four when, when they got back. Nice. All right. I say Sacagawea. Some say Sacagawea. I've I've heard like five different I, pronunciations. I have to say Sacagawea because I'm from North Dakota and that's where she was from. Oh, okay. You're probably right. <laughs> okay, Jody. Until next time. Bye. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye.